again. Hello, everyone. Welcome to <laughs> Blender. Blender UI today. So it's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but every Monday on almost on the Blender channel, we share what's new in Blender today. It's in the last week. And this time we're going to do that, but for the UI module, the user interface side of Blender, which it's a module, but also it's mixed with the other modules. So it's a bit of a, what we're going to show here is some of our work, but actually lots of other people's work as well. So just a, just a roundup. Um, I'm going to present everyone. Here we have Harley. Hey. Hello. I don't know if you know him. I'm Harley uh, from Western Canada. I've been working with the uh, Blender UI module for, I don't know, 13 years. Before I had gray hair. Yeah. So yeah, forever. <laughs> Hans? Hey, I'm Hans. I started working on Blender through the UI with property search. Nowadays, I'm mostly working on nodes, but it's mixed together with UI. As always. <laughs> hey, I'm Julian. Um, I'm doing UI development pretty much since almost 10 years now. I'm f since four years full time at the Blender uh, Institute in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, but I'm also doing some other things like the asset system and uh, I did some VR stuff, but mostly UI. I focus on usability things. I'm not a developer, but I, I try to copy paste other people's work. So, guess that counts. Um, so this is a small uh, roundup. So what happened since, well, we never did a presentation like, the, like this. So what happened since Blender was born 30 years ago? Well, now we have a regular meeting. So every other Tuesday, we do have like an official uh, user interface module meeting, but every Tuesday or whenever it it's needed, we do have, uh, yeah, meeting, short, calls, short, short, short meetings. meetings. Yeah, yeah, we, we two hours. <laughs> Yeah, only two hours or more, um, but it's hard to, yeah, it's like with, with Canada, US, and Amsterdam, it's kind of hard to to put it on a, on a good time slot, but we, but we try. You can read all the, uh, that's also new, we are sharing every um, every outcome of each of the meetings on the Dev Talk forums, and there is some discussions there going on, so you can read what's new and uh, comment on it. Um, it's still in maintenance mode. You wrote this thing. It, the Blender UI module was uh, put on hold or as a, as a maintenance mode, which means that we are not actively, I mean, I don't know. We actively don't say that we're maintaining it. <laughs> I, mean the, I mean, I, mean yeah. I didn't come up with it. It was uh, um, mostly ton, sort of the idea is that, that we currently don't really do bigger changes. Uh, so there's not going to be like another 2.8 project or something like that. Uh, but we do regular development, bug fixing, maintenance, and we can still do uh, changes that are more uh, likely to not cause uh, the uh, pitchforks to uh, get raised. Uh, so yeah, like we still do work, but like we don't do like those uh, bigger overarching changes anymore or currently. We sneak them in. That this presentation is like the opposite of that because we are going to see a lot of uh, these projects that actually are quite, kind of quite big. So I think that saying that it's on maintenance modes is just like, hey, don't blame us if uh, we we don't we didn't tackle this one issue. Um, but I think we are we are to blame. We we should be back, full track, 2024. I, UI 2024. Now we have a name for the project. <laughs> All right, so. Next, use human interface guidelines. We have this document, we have started this document a year or two years ago, right? I think during COVID, I think. <laughs> the idea was to have documentation to, I mean, what, what is already in Blender and try to organize it, but also give it as guideline uh, for other developers, for add-on developers, especially if you, you look at some add-ons and they Let's say they're pretty interesting looking, and it would be much nicer for everybody, you not know, for, for the only the add-on developers to have guides, but also for the users to have a more familiar UI, depend, no matter the, the add-on that they're using or which part of Blender they're using. And uh, there's a lot of limitations in the Blender layout system that may lead to funky UIs, but uh, we can do better. At least just aligning, for example, terminology, how, how which, which, type of word would you use? Like, 
Do you use, if something is normal, don't use the word normal because in, in I don't know, in a vertex has a normal, a face has a normal. Um, custom, custom can be anything. Um, it's a lot of these things. And make a UI consistent with the rest of Blender. I know. Yes. I think it's also a bit useful for us, like uh, it forces us to also think about UI a bit different on a different level and try to come up with actual concepts, not just solve one issue by one, uh, but actually to think about concepts, like try to generalize things and have some uh, consistent ideas throughout the UI. Um, and I mean, I think we figured out a fair amount of things by just working on this and thinking on that level. Yeah. So it's pretty useful, I think. We did, and we keep finding these kind of issues sometimes. Like uh, even even ourselves. Okay, what was our, our thinking back then when we when we actually decided that all labels should start with title case, right? Like why? Um, oh, but also uh, as a place to point other developers. But even I noticed that the translations for Spanish doesn't start all labels with capital like with title case, and that makes it look very different. But in Spanish, actually, it kind of makes sense. So yeah, those things should be written down as a guide for, OK, why are we deciding this? Or for example, there is a new feature I'm going to mention later. It's the input placeholders, which is a small hint of text inside of text inputs. And that's new. So how do you write text in there? Is it title case? Is it lowercase? Is it uppercase? Is it like exclamation marks? We don't know. We need to decide on that. So that's something we're going to. Um, continue working on. It's on the wiki, by the way. It's on the uh, human, just search for human interface guidelines on wiki.blender.org. And with that, we can start a bit of the, talking a bit of the projects that have been worked on, such as? Oh, here, me. All on yours. <laughs> okay, you've got the most boring part first. Um, <laughs> many of you might know me as somebody who's uh, obsesses about single pixels, but I'm also obsessed on typography. Um, I think it's important. I've uh, been working on this for a couple of years, and we've had some milestones now. Uh, the first you'll notice is that we've changed the font for Blender 4.0. Uh, you might like it, you might hate it, but there's uh, reasons why we did it. Um, and, uh, hopefully, I can explain this a bit better. Uh, whoa, is that not what we want? Uh, I wrote down this. Ah, this. Uh, we're trying to move toward typographical correctness. Uh, in Blender, um, although we only use type, you know, in, I don't know, action graphics and titling and in the interface, I think it's important that we deal with it correctly everywhere. Um, it, it just opens up uh, more possibilities for, uh, for using type correctly. So we're sizing now to the 64th of a pixel, positioning as close as we can, 64th of a pixel. I added the uh, sub-pixel anti-aliasing, so we now render individual glyphs on uh, quarter pixels, just so that if you turn that on, you're getting those letters as close as possible to where they're supposed to be. Uh, important to me is that if we now make a font twice the size, it's twice as long, which is really important in an interface that scales. Otherwise, things move all over the place and drive us nuts for the anal of us who like things to be where they're supposed to be. So, yeah, it's just a matter of making everything uh, correct as far as the type uh, font designer was wanting. Uh, there's also been a lot of performance changes. Uh, we cache everything now, uh, the fonts and the faces and the sizes and the glyphs and um, how we look up different parts of um, uh, characters. So it's blazingly quick, but importantly, all the underlying code now allows us to use an unlimited number of fonts simultaneously. Uh, there are roadblocks in the way of that getting to users yet, that we have some fixed size tables in a few places, but we can literally get rid of those and have as many fonts as you want all the time. So that's, that'll come probably to text objects first. Let's see. Um, variable fonts, uh, we've had supports for that for quite a while. These are fonts that um, internally can be not just one weight or width, but the font itself can uh, change over different design axis. Uh, you probably are familiar with these. Um, we have uh, underlying support for all these axes now. Uh, we've just exposed that uh, for 4.1 for the weight of the UI uh, uh, font. So we've changed to enter 
But if you want to use interlight, you can just dial it down to 300, and you've got, you're using interlight in the interface. That's for 4.1. Um, yeah, I think too interesting there. Um, we do have also the underlying code that if a font does not um, is not variable, we just augment it with transforms. Like, um, or if a font has a limited range of weight, say, we will augment it as well. So we could add extra boldness to something that only goes so bold or slant something the opposite way, even though the font doesn't support that. So we have, yeah, all, all that working now. Um, many people may not realize that we replaced our single font before with 24 now that work in a stack. So if you enter a character that's not in that first font, it'll find it in one of the others uh, without having to go through all of them. It's all quite efficient. Uh, we support almost every language in the world now down to about 15 million speakers is what the cutoff we have right now. We'll be adding one, uh, a Cambodian language for 4.1, but we're covering almost everybody now. It's, I think we're missing maybe a half billion people, but <laughs> we're, pretty, we're pretty close to covering everybody. It also means that uh, we have complete and full coverage for most of the uh, Unicode blocks. So really every symbol, every, I don't know, math symbol you want to use, it's all in there. All, the, gl all the glyphs are in there. Emoji? All the emojis are in there, all of yeah. them, including up to 4.1. Come on, yeah, every emoji. Can't skip those. <laughs> the last resort uh, font is in there too, so if you put something in that's totally weird, it'll at least show you something, not a little empty box. Hate that. Um, but future work is important here. Um, I should be able to um, move most of these features into text objects fairly soon, which means that we can uh, use variable features and have it use the fallback stack. Because I just hate that people right now will load up Blender, make a new text object, type something in their own language, and nothing shows up. It's that initial frustration is terrible, um, so this should eliminate that. Everything will show up. With um, right now the limitation that we're not currently doing uh, complex languages, the uh, you know, like right to left languages, like Arabic, but that'll come soonish, I hope. <laughs> uh, the support for um, new output formats, uh, I should be able to get that in fairly soon. What, at the moment, our code um, assumes we're outputting in one format, and we need to be able to add the um, capability of doing multiples simultaneously so that we can do color, uh, sign distance field, or even clear type like output. output. But it's not a matter of just selecting one or the other. Um, if you're doing a sign distance field output, that can't do color. So you've got to have some backups. You have to be displaying them simultaneously. If it's clear type, you've got to take that off if you're moving it around. There's lots of little details there. Uh, the reason I'm going to add support for open type SVG, though, is that those can be used for our current icons. Like, although you, um, you can now find um, icon fonts, those are all just um, strokes, like simple strokes, where our icons need, um, you know, fields of varying opacity, uh, some things that regular fonts don't do yet. Open type SVG does that, which means that if we can put our fonts in there, we've got, you know, infinitely sized fonts, not just the, you know, little tiny ones we have now. Um, the next step after that is adding um, complex shaping so we can do right to left languages and ligatures and all sorts of cool things, but it's really hard. So that might be, <laughs> that might be a, like, I might really add some of that um, to text objects uh, within, I don't know, a couple of releases, but Arabic in the interface could be much longer. It's really difficult to edit these things. It's easy to display them, but editing right to left is really hard, especially when I'm not going to be happy unless we can do uh, mixed languages, so English and Arabic, and then English again. It gets really complex. So. But we'll get there. Uh, most of these things are 4.1 and 4.2, and I can probably get some in there for 4.3. So the next year. Promises. Yeah, promises, promises, promises. But yeah, I'll get there. That's it. That's it. That's it.
is there. Um, yeah. Also, this is your moment. If you need help with, like, uh, I, I don't know if you know all those languages by heart, <laughs> but <laughs> if you need help with uh, people contributing with, like, okay, this is correct, this is not correct, this is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Very much mean, welcome. Yeah, yeah. All right. Find Harley at Harley on uh, Blender chat if you can help with, like, testing those languages. All right. Another big project of last doing well from the last year, but actually a bit before that, that which landed in 4.0, is the asset shelf. And for that, we have our man. Uh, yeah, so the asset shelf. Um, a few years ago, we wanted to, basically the animators from the Blender Studio, but also from all over the world, like the, everybody wanted to have this new, a better post library design. Uh, and uh, we wanted to do that based on the asset browser. Um, that, w that we developed. So um, one of the first things that we figured out when talking about this new pose library design was, okay, animators should be able to just use this in the 3D viewport, uh, that like just even have it in full screen and just have access to their poses all the time, very fast and very convenient. Um, back then we made the decision, okay, we don't have that much time. We also want to kind of get this done for the Sprite Frights pr uh, production so they can actually use it for that. Um, so we kept it simple for the sort of first version, and we came up with this, you know, side by uh, UI. That is, I mean, it worked, it was fine, but wasn't great. <laughs> and you know all the issues that you usually have, like the sidebar, every add-on and their mother already puts uh, their UI in there, so this is sacred space, and you end up animators ended up switching tabs a lot and whatever. Um, so we did work on this new design for the asset shelf, um, and that. The trigger to finally work on this was the brush assets project then, because we also wanted to rethink how people use brush assets in Blender. Um, the current workflow is just really convoluted and not great at all. So um, we came back to this idea of this asset shelf. And so we finally made it work and we decided, okay, let's first get it to work for post libraries and then apply this uh, to brush assets as, as well. Um, so this is not how it looks, but it's close to it. Um, but you can see, uh, you can see, just see your pose at the bottom of the screen and you have the button, the buttons to, um, select different catalogs. So you can, in the asset browser, customize where are your assets in which catalog and then you can really easily browse through the different catalogs of assets. <coughs> uh, yeah, and then you can say, I want to see either my hands or like my mouth or whatever. It's really fast to use, really convenient to use. Um, Productions. And this is basically how you select which catalogs you, you use. You have the tree of catalogs and you just say, these are the catalogs that I want to have and they show up as tabs. A bunch of more features, uh, I'm not gonna go into all of the detail. We put in a lot of effort into op like really optimizing it, fleshing it out well. Um, you can also just resize it and it snaps to like multiples of the, uh, of the preview height and you can resize the previews and show the names and blah, blah, a lot of stuff. Um, so this is sort of uh, very temporary work in progress on brush assets. So in this example for, um, for hair sculpting, curve sculpting. Um, and then you can, instead of using the toolbar and all that kind of stuff, you can just very easily click on the brush in the asset shelf <laughs> and this scales to 100, 200, 500 brushes, whatever. So it's a really scalable UI developed for this kind of use case. Um, so the asset shelf basically is really optimized for using assets. It is not for like uh, authoring assets or like, you know, for that you're still open the asset browser, you have the full context, you can edit the tags and the, the other metadata, the preview image, uh, you can put things in catalogs and, and whatnot. You see all your assets there. This is really optimized for a certain context. So if you go with vanilla blender and you go to post mode currently, then you will be able to use the asset shelf Currently it's hidden by default, so you have to click the little plus icon to show it or do it from the menu. But it's sort of con it's very context sensitive, so it depends on which mode you're in, which tool you have, so you could make it dependent on which tool you're, you're in whatsoever. So it's really optimized for a certain use case um, to show you the assets that you want in that uh, specific situation. Um, I think that's already it. This is not really ordered well, like, <laughs> like uh, Blender today, like you have the, the sections, but I mean, we just throw this out now. So one topic I wanted to talk about was uh, code quality. The Blender UI code 
does have some serious code quality issues and I want to like briefly cover about uh, um, what we can do about it or what my perspective at least on this is. Uh, basically like it's <coughs> very old, like uh, there's still plenty of code from like long before 2.5 in there and then 2.5 things were added and then a lot of development happened and then 2.8 and like, so it's like this thing that just really grow over years and it's layers and layers of hacks and new features and things just sort of added there. Um, and that is really becoming a problem. We often talk about spaghetti code where, you know, everything sort of depends on each other and you fix something or you change a little thing there and something there breaks. Uh, I uh, always say like if you change an icon and your toilet starts flushing, that's a problem. Um, and it's not even like, I mean, I'm sort of joking about it, but it's actually these kind of things happen. Like, very simple example is we did change an icon uh, like a year ago and suddenly drag and drop in some editors wouldn't work anymore. This kind of stuff happens. Like it's stupid what it happens with this kind of code. Um, so here we do start having the issue. Not we don't just, just start having that issue, but many developers really don't want to touch your iCode. <laughs> and there's a good reason for it because they know they are going to break things. It's very complicated and yeah. Um, so there's the big question of course. Do we need a rewrite, like a big project where we replace the entire UI code? And it's kind of like, I kind of want to say ye yes, like we definitely need to rework parts of it, but you easily end up with like second system syndrome where, you know, you try to like replace an entire system and you try to make it perfect and try to really engineer it and, you know, but it actually never gets done and it's a big failure. So. I do want to do things there, some bigger rewrites, but I want to really focus on, okay, how can we sp slice this up and actually make it a bit more manageable so that it actually can happen. Um, I really want something uh, that is a bit more future-proof that uh, gives us a lot of more features, more tooling also to develop user interfaces in Blender, basically. Um, so nowadays we actually do a lot of refactoring. It didn't really use to be that way, but we do really follow the principle nowadays. I think all of us developers of, you know, you leave, leave the campground a bit cleaner than you found it in. So we constantly changed things in the small and also a bit in the bigger, not big architectural changes mostly, but yeah. Um, all the code is compiled in C++ now. Like it's still mostly C code, but we can at least make use of C++ features that helps a bit also to optimize things and stuff. Um, there was a, a, some years ago, I started a bigger refactoring of the outliner. Um, just to start exploring how can we do this better with modern uh, uh, code design. And um, this year we actually had a GSOC student pick up um, that and continue that work there. So that was also really nice. Google some of code. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is views. That is also going in the direction of code quality. They have the awkward name views, maybe it should be like model views or whatever, or data views. But basically, it's this concept of you have some piece, you have some set of data, repetitive data or so, and you want to display that in the UI nicely. Um, and I realized at some point we keep sort of rewriting the same UI. So you have like uh, these list or tree views in like the outliner and the file browser, browser uh, animation channels, UI lists, like the vertex and materials list and that kind of stuff and a bunch of more places. And for every single time we implement, re-implement like the layout, the UI drawing, filtering, uh, um, uh, custom, uh, or like uh, the um, context menus. We, every time we keep re-implementing those things and everything, all of them is like incomplete and like a bit inconsistent and stuff. So the idea was to have a system that basically allows you to create these user interfaces quite easily and have it consistent, have a consistent feature set. It's all run by the same uh, UI system, basically. Um, and the first, or the most prominent example right now are the tree views um, for this, those hierarchical views. Um, and we already use them in a bunch of places. We use them in the asset browser, we use them in the asset shelf. This is now the crease pencil, the new crease pencil uh, V3 UI, basically, for the crease pencil layers. It uses it quite a lot, light linking. Yeah, this is the asset browser. Um, I'm using a picture for the node panels, but they also use it. Um, so yeah, we, we immediately jumped on it and started using this, like uh, different developers jumped on it and started using this already. Um, there's not just, okay, one of the features, uh, for example, that 
is added there now, and that's quite easy to use. It's like actual drag and drop in the uh, tree view. So the crease pencil, for example, uses this. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's quite simple, and it's how it should work. But except of in the outliner, we don't usually have that, just because we always write this the same kind of UI code over and over again. Now we have it unified. Uh, can I not play this and go there? Uh, then there's also the grid view. It uses the same system, has many of the same features. Uh, this is a bit more optimized to be really efficient at, um, or to potentially be really efficient at loading like preview images uh, as you, you scroll over them. Um, and this is the grid view, very simple. Uh, but it uses the same system, same ideas. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, he asked if the asset shelf is uh, meant to replace the toolbar. Uh, I wouldn't say so because tools and assets are still a bit conceptually different. But for a big degree, like in sculpt mode, you wouldn't use the toolbar anymore to select brushes. You did not just use the asset shelf uh, to select your brushes. Um, so practically, to a big degree, yes, but not entirely. Like there's, you're still going to have your transform tools, your uh, annotation so tools, and so. Sorry. I don't think so because, I mean, you can also make, select a transform asset or something, but I don't know. That sounds a bit weird to me. I mean, I, I kind of like the idea you just have a thin row of icons on the side where you select your, your tool, which is like sort of a bit of a mode that you're in. Um, and then you can still, based on that, you can still select different uh, assets. Like if you ha want to have a particle painting brush or so, you can just select the different assets or so. I mean, there are, Again, the asset shelf can replace many of the current use cases of the tool shelf, but it's not going to entirely replace it, I think. We'll have time at the end. I wanted to go through one use, the one situation where people hear of the UI team, which is often when we make a mistake. I'm guessing <laughs> that's probably most of the time when people think of the UI module as a concept is from one of these situations. And <laughs> yes, it happens. Um, but it's part of the process, right? And that's when feedback is super essential. One situation where this came up recently is with the new searching. So you've probably used menu search in Blender already. And that opens one search bar where it opens, it searches every single menu in the current editor. And that's great. But a lot of the times you want to just search a smaller chunk of items. So you want to search everything in the add menu. And in the node editor, people use that all the time. So recently, Jacques here added a feature to search just a single menu. And here, oh yeah, thanks. No one's reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple. <laughs> so yeah, there's this one simple concept, a quicker way to search inside menus. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, but how do but how do we expose it? Um, it should be fast. Uh, it should be easy to use, and it should be consistent. And it should work with the shortcuts that we have in Blender. But it also should work with accelerator keys, those little underlines in menu items that people use a lot more than we expected. I'd say. Um, one other thing we wanted it to be consistent, so we should have this everywhere. But then how do we show people that they can search in any menu just by typing? We don't want to add the search text in every single menu. But how, how else are people going to know? So we thought, in our wisdom, that that's just something you learn as a Blender user. You just type to search in every menu, and people will love it. It'll be fast. But Think of a new user learning Blender for the first time. They will have no clue about this, and it's just another one of those things that people will have to learn. And that's just wasting people's time. Um, so then, I may be missing some parts of this journey, but um, yeah. <laughs> no, like, it's mainly the, yeah, the consistency and trying to fit all of the, all of the requirements, because we, of course, everybody wants it to be fast, and then to be discoverable, and then you only discover it once, and then you just use it. But trying to get all of 
all, all of those requirements together, we, I think, at the end, after some back and forth with the community, <laughs> And uh, the mistake of putting it into the beta release and then get people getting used to the beta and then come back. This is what we end up with, I, th I think. I think we managed to get, um, it is fast now. You just type to search, right? You can, you can press spacebar to type to search. Um, it's discoverable in some menus because there is the search entry. In the other menus, it's a thing you learn. Just press spacebar to search anywhere. Um, it works everywhere if you know how to trigger it. Or if you can also assign in a shortcut, you can right click, assign a shortcut, you can search in any menu. You can even search in the file menu for exporting a USD and FBX. Um, the last item though, should not change how menus currently work. And that is, uh, that's what we did for most of the cases because accelerator keys are still um, available in most menus except in three, the add menus, add modifier, add notes and add objects. They do have a, a type to search by default. So you do shift A, cube, and you have a cube. Uh, you don't have to start, you don't have to click on search. Uh, but the, there is a search indicator there. So we kind of managed, I think. And it's so fast. This is how you add a modifier now. Um, of course, if you, like the first time is, it, the second time, it is not sped up, by the way. This is has how it works at the moment. If you do shift A, well, this is a combination of features. Shift A in, um, shift A to add a modifier, start typing right away, and then you find it. Um, this change in the menu also came with some extra benefits to add um, assets, modifier, node groups from geometry nodes. But um, in a nutshell, I think it's a much, much more usable experience with search. That's it with search. So the, the trade-off there is being bold and making the big change that will theoretically possibly upset users and then taking the feedback and actually listening to people and finding a compromise. I think that that's not the worst way to do it because it gives us the opportunity to make the solid change that keeps Blender's design consistent but also encounters that uh, ideal with the reality of how people use Blender. So. Just that's that's how things happen behind the scenes sometimes. Yeah. Um, all right. So we hope to continue well to improve this uh, to not let this happen again. A change like this so late in the development, it was a combination of of things. Uh, just recently, recent as in the last few months before this happened, the team started having meetings more often. And that came with a lot of traction with, a, with some of it being backlog of features, some of them being features uh, in, introduced by other modules, uh, like with the help of Jack with the recent search, making the search results show up, show the, the latest things that you search for. And that triggers like, oh, maybe we can improve also search in other ways. And that triggers like enthusiasm and uh, um, yeah, wanting to make everything better until the very last minute, and um, it's not gonna happen again. 4.1, the, the, that would be the good 4.0. Um, and some other projects that we uh, worked on, this is uh, the next, it's actually uh, just Inter, just to blind you all for a moment. This is uh, the, the, the font that was introduced and it was mentioned by Harley. Um, another, Font design for once. We have this uh, uh, font that is designed for interfaces. Um, it's not exactly this one on the website. Actually, we do have some changes for the numbers. The numbers look a bit different uh, in Blender. Yeah. It is a it's a feature from the from the font. They give you two types of uh, numbers to choose from, and we went with some that are easier to read. On, I think uh, on interfaces like Blender. Then input placeholders. This is, looks like a small thing, but it's the text here, the, the hints in this part there. It's such a small thing, but it's on every website out there and you don't notice. It's just sometimes you expect it, right? Sometimes you have an input field that doesn't say anything, um, but it, it's an email. You know that it's an email because it says email at example.com or something. And in Blender, in this case, this is not the most useful um, uh, showcase in, in this example because active clip, it's a, well, a clip in Blender. What is a clip even, right? So a movie clip. Okay, that's the data type. Scene, this, it says background scene. Scene, that's a bit redundant. Okay, 
Camera, not so much. Camera, what is it? Camera data or camera object? So you know it's an object. And in many other areas in Blender, you don't know exactly what, um, what does it mean. Some, sometimes the field could say coordinate, of, uh, coordinate system, and then the hint is going to tell you which type of object to use. Um, the way of adding this placeholder is pretty, also pretty simple, and we hope that add-on developers are going to start using them on their own with the placeholder or forks too, <laughs> and with placeholder and just add some text, just like you would with any uh, any text label in Blender. Another, whoops, another change. <clears throat> a list of changes though, that is way too long to, to fit in this presentation. The, the header in the Blender 4.0 and in 4.1, um, there are some changes coming, but in 4.0 already has a cutout, so it doesn't block the view when it's not needed. Nice. Region pie, it's not food, it's a pie menu for changing the region, um, toggling the sidebar, the header, the, the footer, or the asset shelf when there is an asset shelf or a footer when there is a footer in some editors. Highlight selected item, that also sounds like so, what is that? Even so simple, but it's this thing, which might not look like much, but it's, once you, you get used to it, like, I don't know if you noticed, but the item that I have selected is highlighted in the list. This list has four items, right? But when the list is longer, it's nice to see, okay, what was the thing that I had selected? Um, also, a small thing, but uh, not so trivial, so thank you, Harley, for <laughs> working on that. Um, the Add Modifier menu that I just mentioned, Node Panels, here we're taking credit for other people's work. Thank you, Lucas. And um, that also ripples to other parts, like the UI for materials. Also, some work done by Brecht to integrate it in that, that area. Um, viewport Overlay Popovers, now the list of popovers for the object mode is not huge, yet, because probably developers are going to continue adding more <laughs> now that there is room for them. And the, the, pop, the overlays for each mode are split into their own popover, so it's, things are easier to find and more discoverable. File and asset browser improvements. Now, uh, the asset browser and the file browser now supports transparency for the background, right? Like a checkerboard and uh, SVGs oh, yeah. and uh, like so many, like even the full names of the um, of the, if you leave the mouse over, you get a tooltip with the full names. So such small things here and there, but huge improvements. Outline or drag and drop between windows, also hardly. Statistics, also hardly, <laughs> um, per object. So you don't, you, you can see the total number of, of, uh, of vertices or object faces and for the selected objects. So you can see, uh, instead of just seeing all of them, like if you have 20 objects, you can select five and then you get these stats for those five objects. Also super handy. Once you get used to it, it's like, how did we live without that before? Uh, canvas picker in, in paint modes. You can, while you're painting a attributes or um, yeah, weight paints, uh, vertex groups, color attributes, and uh, even images in sculpt mode, you can now pick, you can select from the 3D viewport without actually going to the material or the properties editor, you can select them from there. Strip lines for invalid caches in Timeline. This is one of so many. I wanted to add this one here for uh, to thank Leon for all his work, but it's done so many, so many um, improvements that this is small, but it's also huge. This is for the um, the cached lines in the timeline, so you can see when something is invalid. And uh, it shows nice stripe lines. We don't have that concept anywhere in Blender. I wonder where else can we can we use that. Um, new progress indicators. This is not even used yet anywhere in Blender, but it's there. It's a way to display progress in a small space. This is going to be used for the extensions uh, platform and for any add-on developer that needs to show progress in a small space without a progress bar. Um, also, thanks, Harley. <laughs> and uh, recent search results, thank Shaq, and hundreds of small spaces tweaks and fixes. When I was typing this, is, is it really hundreds? Is it thousands? I mean, you could say, but hundreds at least with all the, uh, since Blender was made, thousands. Yeah, yeah, but everybody. So thanks, Don. <laughs> and um, that's, that's about it, but there is so, so much more. And the uh, future, actually, this, this slide, I didn't share it with them, so it's more of a wish list on my side. 
um, and some of the work that we know that we are going to work on. Integrate the extensions platform, extensions.blender.org. It's a website that is not even running yet, so don't even go there. But it is the. it was announced uh, last year. There is a blog post on the code blog about, for the very first time, having Blender be aware of the internet. Yay. And extending with add-ons and in the future other areas like assets in the future from within Blender access the internet. That's a big, it's a big project, right? Blender needs to be aware of the internet, which we know many add-ons, they're already connect to the internet, which is not so great because everybody tries to do it at the same time when they open Blender, right? They check for updates and then it's a bit overwhelming for the, for Blender to start that way. So we need to think of a way to make it a bit more manageable or a way for Blender to toggle uh, internet offline mode, airplane mode. <laughs> a better Kimap editor or a Kimap editor at all, because the one we have now, it's far from um, ideal in some situations. It needs each, yes, I know, right? This, is, this should be like top priority. And to me, it is one of my top priority, but I'm not a developer, so I can only just wish we can uh, work on this, although it is pretty, pretty huge. So um, working on that would mean not working on many other also very important parts of Blender, um, like conflict detection for, for key maps or key map layers or who knows. Editor tabs, this is with a question mark because it's a, it's a mock-up that, I mean, it's, it's something that we would like to work at some point, part of improving the way the editors work in Blender and they get split and joined and a lot of this work was already done by Harley in the previous releases. It is so much better than it used to be, and we would like to maybe do some research, investigate how tabs could work. The same way we have tabs for workspaces, but for editors, because that way we could even simplify the, the, the whole UI a lot more. In the timeline, for example, that we have at the bottom could have tabs for the graph editor and the um, and all the animation editors, pretty much. The compositor, I use the shortcut Shift F3 to change between the editors, and, and it takes me a bit to understand where am I? Geometry nodes, materials, texture nodes, and shading nodes, I just continue. Um, replace UI list with views. I think this is more of a cleaning up, but also bringing those features into more parts of Blender, that was already mentioned. A simpler theme editor, yep, now it's ours is, uh, a bit overwhelming and improved documentation, so much more and excitement because there are many things that people contribute from the community which we don't know yet what we're gonna talk about in next year. And I think that's it, questions? Yeah, yeah. so, all right, here. No. Um, there is an add-on, I think, an older one there is that, if I input the add-on correctly, it allows you to highlight the color that's in the display, depending on the camera user can do that, or you have to go into Premiere Pro. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. Like quit your other things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I know this is going to sound like a huge thing, but to see the new theme editor and the theme overall is, is a giant bonus, I think. It, yeah. So the question or yeah, the, the, the comment is about a simpler theme editor and how it could improve the, the way we edit themes now. I mean, if I have to choose between KeyMap Editor and Theme Editor, KeyMap is there and Theme Editor is still important, but you can edit it now. You just need to like type text and XML text. Uh, no, um, it's, it, it, is a, it is an important project, especially to improve accessibility and make things simpler. But also, not so much simple that we run out of the options that we have now, because at some point, many, many, many years ago, I was like, why do we need to set the header, different header color for every editor and or the tabs? Different background color for the tabs on every single editor. Why do we need options for that? 
And I was like, we should just nuke that. And nowadays, I don't think like that. I think we should have a way where you should say, my tabs, I want this one color. And then go and being able to override that per editor. I think it is still useful because I ran into, over this, all these years, ran into some screenshots of people or sharing their, or some screencasts on YouTube where people with, um, yeah, with either some uh, visual impairment, visual impairments have these changes in their blender because it makes them like I know the the yellow bar editor it's this and the red bar editor is this other thing so I think flexibility is not a bad thing you wanted to say something oh I just want to say that the, I know you wanted an, uh, a simpler theme editor but I think you still want lots of customization I just wanted to say that if it was up to me there'd be less customization because some of the the, the theme options we give users keep us from implementing some features, yeah. right? Like we had some problems with um, highlighting the, um, the uh, active enum while also having hover highlight. So we're having to do two things at once and that's a limitation of our theme. But you know, I can't show, um, uh, say, focus because we can't have the outline because you guys have the outline, right? Like I would like to take some th themes back and have less customization so that we can give you more features because there is a conflict there. I mean, in a, yeah, in a perfect world, you know, we would have a light and a dark theme that we would have to maintain and you'd have less customization. I just got, I'm not sure how that would be re re uh, received, right? But I would love that. Just want to, just want to add to the theme thing. Uh, many years ago, I think long before 2.8, I counted the, uh, amount of theme options that we have. And if I remember correctly, it was something like 750 or so. And since then, we, of course, added many more theme options. <laughs> well, I didn't, but other. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, probably a few. Uh, but yeah, it's like, how do you control this? And there actually are add-ons uh, that make that easier. I think it's mostly a matter of abstraction. Like, uh, you know, you don't ne really need to control every little theme option yourself, but sometimes even the theme toggle is really useful or just, you know, if you have like a color palette of 10, well, three, five, 10, 20 colors or whatever, uh, would also already be useful. Some add-ons already do that. If we want to solve this, we want to do it properly and like have a proper theme editor actually. But until then, add-ons. Yeah. Peter, yeah, right? So the question is regarding drag and drop of uh, FBX or any other file format to trigger the import system in Blender if, instead of first deciding which file format you want and then deciding on what to what to do with it. There is a patch, right, being worked on by Guillermo, also another contributor, uh, online contributor. Do you know? Well, there are two things. One is like uh, having the drag and drop thing. Um, there's also a, uh, an idea to have a unified in interface basically for importers, exporters uh, to use that is, I think, being developed with uh, uh, the USD uh, importer. Um, you can talk to Precht about that. <laughs> um, uh, and then, yeah, for the drag and drop thing, there is a patch uh, from a contributor. He made a first version uh, that was basically just hard coding it uh, for OBJ and there were we had some concerns like it would conflict if you have multiple uh, OBJ importers or uh, it's hard code and everything. But he's now uh, working on a more dynamic version, uh, which is a much more promising direction. So you can just register your own file type and say, uh, I want to, this is how I want to import things. There's still a question of how do you handle the properties like after importing and that kind of stuff, but yeah. Yeah, it sounds pretty simple actually. It's like actually the, the, this developer made a object like .obj drag and drop support and that was working. But uh, it, it is a lot more complex, especially if you want add-ons to be able to register their own drag and drop stuff. It's just, yeah. All right, here, sorry. <laughs>
one point I thought I saw that the uh, uh, capital I was going to have the asterisk on it. Did that get reverted? Because of the examples, it wasn't showing that. Oh, I might find it, but I can, it, when I type it, fill, I can tell what it says. <laughs> oh, you, you know, you'd like it. We have the strips back. I mean, it's, um, it'll bother. Hey. It'll bother some people that a sans serif font has serifs for the I and the L's are slightly curled, but we selected that disambiguation um, option for that font, you know, for users that need it. I, I like that. That's what I want. Yeah. I mean, there'll be an equal number of people who will prefer the other way, but we wanted to keep it for people that re require it, you know, where it's not a, a choice. It's, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then Accessibility. The Actually, even of all things, you can now get a desktop monitor that has high refresh rate C in its display, and uh, it, it doesn't sound like it would be practical for most use cases. No. But it's just a, a, a line of text that has some great PS on yep. these pieces. I, I can text on it, and it's going to be really great on the eyes. But existing anti uh, subpixel anti-aliasing models conflict with both of these monitor types because of subpixel yeah. aliasing. So it's an added thing for considering. Oh yeah, you no. Know, if we get there, you'd have to be able to select, uh, you know the RGB ordering, that, that's fine. I mean, what I've got so far is really something separate, which is literally rendering the uh, each glyph for the correct sub-pixel positioning, where that's more like uh, Windows clear type, the, the blue and red fringes on the sides, yeah. basically. Yeah. And yeah, we can get there once I've uh, got support for multiple um, outputs at once. Because again, e even if, if we could just select that, you can't render that way for moving text, say, right? Like there's a lot of weird things with it, so I need to be, have, be able to do that and other formats at the same time. And uh, that should be, I don't know, soon. <laughs> yes, Bob? Vertical. Vertical tabs. But that was tackled in 3.3, uh, I think. This, like that they don't get, don't get uh, yeah, yeah, this, this was actually a few releases ago. Okay. By Guillermo, the one working on the drag and drop. Yeah, so thank you, Guillermo, if you're watching. <laughs> yeah, but what if you have too many of them? It's just gonna scroll, just scroll. Yeah, yeah it scrolls, yeah, it scrolls like, uh, like uh, the rest. So it's, it's just like this, like in, okay, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there is no scroll bar, but yeah. Uh, Green? Ah, yeah, pretty soon. No, it's a Blender feature. <laughs> Andrew? Yeah, I keep meeting users who are like using 2.8 or whatever, and they don't know that there's a new mode for that. Is there any plan or hope to check and notify you? Yeah. So the, the question is if, uh, because there is many people that are still stuck in older Blender versions, that are potentially slower even than like the, the computer can handle a newer blender, <laughs> but it's slower. Um, yeah, so if there are plans to notify users, yes. Once we have the extension platform in place, which is the, like introduces this concept of blender connecting to the internet, we do want to have a place online, like, a, like an API somewhere blender can ping for like a, a JSON, just a text file that says, hey, there is a new ver a blender version and which one it is. Um, we would like to do this, especially for the LTS releases, because the long-term long, the long -term release, uh, long-term support releases, because those are a no-brainer. You want to upgrade always, and it does get, get updated for two years. So yeah, we want to do that. But again, it's a, it takes some design. Where do you do that? Like off by default, for sure, but people should be able to, I don't know, maybe go to help check for updates or in the in the splash screen the, at the beginning they could but it should be off by default blender should not connect to the internet by default yeah we want that blender should work offline off the shelf 
Yeah, but well, that's why we are eh? setting all your data. Yeah, no, not setting all your data. You don't you don't need to send any data other than your Cloud and Blender version. Um, but still, I think we would like to keep it that way. So by default, no permission to access the internet in any ways unless you explicitly ask for it. And uh, probably yes, but. Um, yeah, well, in the splash screen, we can show it, right? Like, check just a check for updates, yeah. Check for updates, so even like after three months or so of a Blender version, it could say like there's probably a new version, like you don't even need to connect to the internet because we know Blender is gonna get updated in some months anyway, right? So we can, uh, can already show it in the UI, say after three months, maybe you should check if there's an update. Yeah. Yeah, you can do it offline, right? If the, if the option is off, is off yeah. It's over there. Uh, as Leon mentioned, uh, current models allows are in the empire. Uh, is there any like plan to um, give more extensions for any developers to override or to create custom ones like any like Leon or any other ones? So the question is like because all the add-ons use the sidebar to, um, to yes yeah, to populate the, to place their their add-on options. If there are plans to introduce new, like being able to introduce new editors or new areas in Blender. So that's a two, two part problem. One of them is like, why does your add on that has nothing to do with the viewport, they all choose to put it in the sidebar in the viewport? You can literally add a button anywhere in Blender, everywhere. You can even add, like, I don't know, any here, there, there, in the, the header, in the everywhere. But for some reason, people choose the sidebar. And maybe they need some, like we need to educate uh, add-on developers to like, no, you can actually, you know, maybe reuse the name. Like if you're, if you're making a, a, something related to the view, don't call it view max, view plus for making a new tab. Should I use the view tab and just add something out here. Item, the item tab is only one option, <laughs> one panel. Uh, but yeah, that's one part, but I think we do want to expand. Also, just a brief practical one. Uh, maybe don't call your tabs the name of your add-on. <laughs> name what the add-on is about. Like if it's about animation, just name it animation. Then you have one animation tab with all your animation tools in there. Don't give it the name of your add-on. Like just a little uh, uh, tip there. <laughs> there's, also, there's also sort of conflicting design goals where one is that add-ons should be integrated with Blender in the UI well, but then maybe some add-on is really doing something entirely different and that's where it makes sense, but it is a rather huge project to add custom editors, so maybe not super high on the priority list. Yeah. Yeah, actually I wanted, I don't know if, uh, I'm not gonna show it, but in the in Blender 2.70 is when the tabs were introduced and I don't know if we mentioned it here in the user interface, tabs were introduced and there is a part there is a section dedicated to documentation on how to, um, how to actually use the tabs. There is like tabs and it's somewhere here, like there is a, there's guidelines, huh? Ah, here, guidelines on how to use it. And we expect there is a place where like add-on developers are, should make an effort to only create new tabs <laughs> when necessary, which, as we can see, everybody uses and learn and read and. Yeah, I mean, in general, the question like how do add-ons integrate in the UI is a big one, right? This is like a, a big box uh, that we could open up and talk about. Um, in general, yeah, maybe custom editors would help. I'm a bit skeptical because people already don't follow the existing UI guidelines and just suddenly everybody creates their own editors and you just get a ginormous list of editors for every add-on. Um, but to the to big degree, it's also just providing better tools, better uh, documentation guidelines, like how should you write, write user interfaces. Our human interface guidelines, I think, are important for that. Uh, and then, yeah, better tools like people just often walk around our, our UI system basically and try to create user interfaces that sort of do what they want to do, but they're anything but great user interfaces. And uh, with some better uh, tooling, with better options for add-on developers, I think we can also solve many problems that we have there. 
question. Mm -hmm. Sir? <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah, the Blender apps, what it, it was announced last year, two years ago, and uh, it turned out to be a bit too early to announce that because there were so many other parts of Blender that needed attention, and some of those are going to be used for the, for the Blender apps. But, um, but yeah, integrating them as part of, of Blender, I think extending the widget system, the tooling in general, like being able to make new tools with geometry nodes maybe, that will all like lead to this uh, this development so it is in line but it's not officially there yet okay. sebastian Any other questions? <laughs> no, I mean, we talked about this. Yeah, he's basically asking about an option to keep the, the viewport orientation when you switch workspaces. And, you know, when we designed the original workspaces, that was one of the main ideas that we had. Like, this is something that should be there. Uh, it just never happened. Uh, there's actually a patch, I think, I haven't looked at it in a while, that adds this. There was an earlier version that was, I think, a bit awkward to use. Uh, from a design perspective, I think the new version may be a bit better, but we should actually look at that again. Uh, but just uh, to, to respond to that, uh, the, the lo change in the local view, that was changed recently. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you don't get uh, lost when but, you yeah. change the local view. Just reuse that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the local view did the opposite. It would, well, it actually would change the view to focus on the, the yeah, local object, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it doesn't have, have that anymore. But it's a bit of a different thing. That was just basically disabled. Well, I think it doesn't zoom in on it anymore, or how does it work now? There's an option. Oh, it's an option, yeah. Okay. But yeah, that's, uh, that's something I, I would also like to, to see, but, all, but yeah. for all the... Like, for example, if you go into scripting, then you get a new viewport, so you're having the same camera, and it's not so bad. Yeah, yeah, something like keep the views connected. We even have an icon for that already, because there is a screen icon with a lock. Yeah. And there are items that do this, but they... But th there's also the question of how much data you want to sync between the viewports. Maybe you don't want to sync the overlays, maybe you just want to sync the transforms, but then maybe there's some important setting that you want to share, and that's how it balloons into this huge design topic that sort of feels impossible. Although I think the idea was always to just have the viewpoint, because the idea of the workspace is still they put you sort of in a new context and they give you all the tools for this different task, but people end up not using them, them as much because every time they change, it's like, oh, they get disoriented, like, where am I in my 3D scene? Um, so just having this bit of consistency would be nice. Yeah, just a bit more background. That uh, that would be like the connected view point between workspaces. The other feature about the overlays and everything, we and all the settings in the in each editor, it's for, for 2.8, actually, when we were coming up with, like, okay, which modes can we should we use? Which ones should we should be customizable. And yes, we part of the design, the idea was that we should be able to make your own presets, basically, of a combination of these settings so you can have your own. Uh, that, that would be one way of connecting between, between views. But yeah. Viewpoint yeah, better. viewpoint, yeah. That was something else, yeah. Another question, I don't even know. I saw another presentation here. We are the last ones? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Oh, dinner. Hi. Yeah, sorry, there's two <laughs> questions. Uh, over there? Uh, do you guys have any plans for adding more options for uh, custom UI layouts for Blender? Like, can you switch to other, like, I want a table with, like, I would still want to use some text, so I can put data over the, the, the text. 
Uh, con uh, the question is if if they will there are plans to make the build thing confirmation operators that you don't have to dialog windows. Like um, I I don't know if there are plans, but I don't think so. It's like more no, general. But uh, I would love to make them more uh, configurable. Like uh, my. Well, yeah, really what I'd like to do is to have um, optional confirmation on almost all operators that are turned off by default, and we can just turn on what we want, right? It seems dumb to have some that have confirmations, some that don't, and we have to decide which ones are there. Um, yeah. yeah. I think what, what you're asking for is like uh, in, in some widget toolkits, you can just spawn a pop-up and it's a confirmation pop-up, basically, without having to connect it to an operator. Um, I don't think we have plans for that necessarily. Um, we could edit. I do have concerns because then people will start adding pop-ups all the time and we do not want that in Blender kind of. Um, like generally pop-ups should be used scarily like when they actually make sense. They should be undo instead. Like <laughs> um, you don't need a pop-up if you can just undo something. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a plan to add an API call for that specifically. But if there's a patch, we can discuss it or if somebody comes up with a design, design first piece would be nice. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, concerning the text window, as I saw in the main file manager, I'm not sure how it is for the tool stuff. Is the text window the other part and this user experience thing? Do we do this to break it like it was in the Blender Code 6? For example, do we just say do text width, both or solely, and do we not even make it split by other text? It's regarding texture notes edit. The question is regarding texture notes editor. Um, so if it's basically going to be brought back to life, yeah. <laughs> yes or no, and uh, I, yes, I think the goal is to to face it out and instead work on um, bringing back those some of those features, but with like first layered materials, so a way to to combine and layer textures. There is a it was it was announced as a strategical project I think two years ago, and uh, it's still in the in the schedule for some point, I think, um, 2020X. On a simpler level, there's also this idea that node group types can be more flexible. So if you use nodes that are common between the compositor, shader nodes, and geometry nodes, you could use the same node group in many places. And that sort of is one of the use cases of texture nodes, is to make this reusable node group that can be used in multiple areas of Blender. So Maybe that sort of system can just be not sort of necessary in a lot of cases anymore. Bob? If you use the four view, uh, would it be possible to be able to shape them on a per view? Because if you if you turn on shading, it's going to shade all four of them. And I would like to be like only the perspective view, for example, to be shaded and then one in wireframe. Mm -hmm. Feature request. <laughs> the <laughs> question is, is if it would be possible to have different uh, shading per quadrant, basically. Um, that, was, that sounds really complex, right? Because you have to load the textures only in one. So it's based, I don't know. I am not the one to answer this, but I, I think it can be technically quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also, you need to evaluate data for different view, viewports and stuff. Um, it's not really planned, I don't think so. Um, the quad view isn't really designed for that in Blender. Um, Blender just works a bit different, but yeah, I don't think it's, that is going to happen soon. Yeah. Yeah, question. Sorry. So in the Python API that we pushed for the ADU and Hex, is there a good reason why we don't have a paragraph section? Oh, like a text area. OK, the question is if in the layout, yeah, basically text wrapping or multi-line uh, multi or in web, it's called a text area. Um, like a reason, I don't know, the reason it's we need it. Done. UI code quality. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, do, I did a prototype some time ago to have multi-line labels uh, that automatically wrap. Um, and I, so basically I have an idea on how to do it. It's just one of those things that I kind of have to get to, or maybe someone else or so, but it's a bit tricky because, yeah, UI code quality. Yeah. Yeah, we need it, for example, for the note uh, part. So many places. In meta I don't know, so many places. Any other question? You're hungry? because dinner is ready. So thanks everyone. <laughs>